Chapter 45, Confrontment. In the rowdy, crowded tavern, somewhere deep in snow country, the hostess warmly regarded her patrons. It was to be another successful night, but that was only to be expected. Her business was well regarded for the sweetness of their drinks and their company, and there was more than enough for her customers to fill their stomachs and hearts for the night. As her gaze traveled fondly from one smiling face to another, she noticed a lone man with a shaggy white mane hunched over a table. Something about him looked familiar. It took her another moment to put the face to the name, and when she did, for a split second, a crack appeared in her pleasant demeanor. If she wasn't wrong. And she rarely was, there should be a lifelong ban on that old pervert. So what was he doing here? One sharp look towards her hired men, and a few minutes later, the hostess watched with satisfaction as the pervert was roughly escorted to the door. He went without protest, to her surprise, but perhaps the cretin was finally starting to see his wrongdoings? His expression even seemed rather distraught and remorseful. If the hostess had been a weaker woman, her heart might have even twinged at the sight of him. But she had not gotten to where she was today by being weak, so she slammed the door shut behind the infamous hermit and thought, good riddance. Naruto, POV Waves sloshed against his feet as Naruto looked out at the shore. The skies were clear, and beyond the circling seagulls, the horizon seemed endless. It reminded him of a different time, in another part of the world. This is the ocean? Karen's voice said wonderingly. It's my first time seeing it. For a moment, Naruto found himself taken aback by this piece of information. Before realizing that for a genin, especially one like Karen, her inexperience wasn't all too surprising. Looking back out at the water, he found himself wondering what else she had yet to see. Somewhere beyond that horizon, there's a hidden village, he said. The hidden whirlpool. Officially, the village was destroyed in a war, but that didn't mean there was nothing left there. In fact, there was a chance Naruto would be able to learn something there to help him control the Nine Tails. It was all there in the letter Jiraiya left behind for Naruto with the messenger Toad. As you well know, the fourth Hakage entrusted the key to your seal with me, to strengthen or weaken it as needed, when the time came. I have not forgotten that you did not wish to depend on a power that you could not completely control. But now that the time has come, I wonder whether you have found yourself looking towards a goal that you cannot reach on your own. And while it is no longer safe for you in the hidden leaf. A large part of which may be due to my deplorable actions. As I once told you, Naruto, where there is a will, there is always a way. When Jiraiya spoke those words to him before, it was in the context of learning Fuinjutsu. Specifically, the place where Jiraiya had studied the esoteric art. The hidden whirlpool. Given that information, it seemed to be the logical location where Jiraiya had hidden the key to Naruto's seal. Of course, going to Whirlpool was a feat easier said than done. It was a widely acknowledged truth that with the destruction of the village in the war, there was virtually no way to access the islands that had once encompassed it. The secret to navigating the whirlpools that were a natural phenomenon of the region was said to have died with its people, and the lack of natural resources had dampened any possible interest in repopulating the area. Shadow Clone Technique in a cloud of smoke, ten of his clones materialized around Naruto, before leaping away into the forest at their backs. They had the instruction of gathering information on the current unfolding situation, in order to report back to Naruto as needed. The location of any nearby settlements, the movements of Akatsuki, the whereabouts of any remaining Jinchuriki, the ongoing hunt for Naruto, now a missing Nin. All this was just a tip of the iceberg. There was so much more he needed to know. But that was nothing new for Naruto. I think my mom used to talk about the hidden whirlpool, Karen suddenly spoke up. She had been wandering the shore, her gaze purposeful and focused. Now, her feet came to a stop, and her shoulders rose up and down with every slow intake of the salty air. She used to say that years ago, before we were in the hidden grass, we originally came from the sea. That the sea protected us from the war. She paused. I guess she was wrong. After the hidden whirlpool was destroyed, most of the survivors moved to the hidden leaf. Most, but not all. I wouldn't be surprised if Karen is one of their descendants. Naruto's gaze drew to Karen's bright red hair. A lone seagull squawked in the air above them. Let's go take a look, then, he said at last. Yugido POV Even for a place like Rain Country, it was an especially foreboding day. Rain poured down from the dark skies, disappearing into the already drenched earth. Lightning shredded the sky, followed by a deep rumbling. The streets of Omegakur were mostly barren, as its inhabitants closed their shutters in favor of the warmth of their homes. 
Not so far from their gates, a lone hooded figure stepped along a muddy pathway, accompanied by a trail of faintly flickering blue flames. A pair of dark eyes glared out from under the hood. They belonged to the hidden clouds surviving Jinchuriki, Yogito. Yogito had seen better days, which was saying something, given her history and the harsh training she had undergone in her childhood. But now she was the lethal combination of cold and wet, and ever since she had lost track of her target in the fog, she had been rapidly losing morale. How much time had passed since Killer B had been captured? Four, five days? While Yagido didn't want to consider it, she was a trained Kanoichi first and foremost, and the decreasing likelihood of her fellow Jinchuriki's survival was something she could no longer deny. Nonetheless, she could not abandon her mission. Not without evidence that it was a lost cause. That, at the very least, was what Killer B deserved. At this point, entering the hidden rain, the enemy's stronghold, would be nothing short of suicide. But the hidden cloud was a village that considered. Had considered. Their allies with a caution that rivaled their regard for their enemies, and she knew there had to be some long-term undercover agents still out in the field. Unfortunately, the issue was that with news of the hidden cloud's demise, it would take some time to re-establish contact with these agents. Some may have called it hubris, for they had never prepared for the possibility of total, utter defeat. Whatever the case, one thing was clear. Yagito had to do something before she drove herself insane. You're fighting a losing battle there, purred the two tails. Haku, POV. Ajisai had heard the rumors. Heard that their lord had transcended all limitations of mortality, and she had always had faith in such whisperings, of course. But seeing was sometimes more than believing, and as she followed at the heels of this feminine deity that had revealed herself to them, she felt tears come to her eyes. Everything would be okay, she realized. Now that Lord Payne was here, all her worries were meaningless, her concerns made trivial. As such thoughts swam about in Ajisai's head, a short distance away, her teammate Haku continued to survey their surroundings with a keen gaze. In particular, the cloaked girl who was silently leading the way. While her features had struck Haku as oddly familiar, with every passing second, he was growing increasingly certain that he had never met her before, and increasingly uncertain as to whether the girl was even human. Was it true? Was she actually the leader of Akatsuki, Pain? Then who was the man that Haku had glimpsed on rare occasions back in the hidden rain? In fact, who was Pain? Haku had heard the rumors of Pain's omnipresence, but was Pain just a shared name for a group of individuals? Somehow, Haku didn't think that was quite right. Suddenly, with a shrill chirp, a blue bird burst through the fog and landed on the girl's shoulder. Again, Haku was struck with a strong sense of deja vu that he tried to shrug off with little success. The hidden cloud has fallen, said the girl. Pain, Haku reminded himself. She turned around, her strange eyes slowly scanning each of their faces. The hidden mist is still picking up their pieces, the hidden rock has run away with its tail between its legs, the hidden sand is a mere shadow of its prior self, and the hidden leaf is on fire. Now, at this crossroads, you have come to us. She paused. But by whose call? Yours, and yours alone, Lord Pain, murmured Ajisai, her head bowed in deference. Pain didn't respond, instead, she raised a hand, and immediately, the thick fog drew back in a display of absolute obedience. Haku felt his eyes widen as he took in the giant maw of a cave that seemingly appeared out of nowhere before them. He hadn't been able to sense it at all, undoubtedly, he would have walked straight past it if he had not been shown the way. Without any hesitation, the others began to follow Pain into the dark cave. But as Ajisai's form was swallowed up by the shadows of the cave, Haku's felt his right arm suddenly throb. Instinctively, he brought it closer to his body, and his feet faltered. Caught alone before the pitch black that gaped before him, the impenetrable fog at his back, Haku's heart stilled. He had thought that with the death of Kakashi of the Sharingan, the throbbing would cease. That by avenging Zabuza, the phantom pains that woke Haku up in the middle of the night would subside. It seemed. That was not the case. A face emerged from the dark. Pain. The girl with the horrifyingly familiar face. Her ringed eyes pierced ruthlessly into Haku, and her tone was just as hollow. You are lost. Who are you? Asked Haku. Why do I know you? She didn't respond, silently regarding Haku instead with an unreadable expression. What's in this cave? Is this Akatsuki's hideout? What do you want from us? When no response was forthcoming, Haku stopped. It was clear that he was asking the wrong questions. His right arm throbbed by his side, and he exhaled. What can you offer me? Finally, that earned him a smile. A disarming smile. For a lingering moment, Haku thought he could have believed that the girl had once been human. 
the world where you are needed, she said in a cold voice that belied her face and her words. A shiver ran down Haku's spine, he knew she was lying. But when she beckoned towards Haku, this time, he didn't hesitate. Naruto, POV With the help of Naruto's clones and Karen's sensory ability, they soon discovered a small fishing village along the coastline. It seemed it had once been a busy harbor that bridged Fire Country with its greatest ally, but these days, very few ships took refuge in its docks. Instead, a series of worn-down fishing boats dotted the harbor, bobbing listlessly in the hot summer breeze. The few people outside gazed hungrily at Naruto and Karen as they made their way to the lone structure with smoke rising from its chimney. A local pub. They made no effort to disguise themselves. In a village so small and out of the way, the moment that two strangers had appeared, word of them would have spread through the villagers like wildfire. Standing atop the steps leading to the pub was a child dressed in a threadbare smock, and as they passed by, he stumbled. Naruto's hand whipped out and firmly grabbed the wrist of the child. Careful, he said, giving a reprimanding squeeze before letting go. As the boy let out an answering yelp and scampered away, Naruto was struck by an odd sense of deja vu. Naruto, Karen called, motioning towards the pub. It's here. There were four people that looked up at them the moment they entered. The male bartender and three locals. The one that immediately drew Naruto's attention was the man sitting in the far back corner who'd quickly averted his gaze. Dressed in a working man's garb and cap that almost concealed his bright red hair, his face was worn in a way that hinted at extensive seafaring experience. Even without Karen's confirmation, Naruto knew that this was the chakra signature they had followed to the village the signature that was far too large to belong to any ordinary civilian. Can I help you? said the bartender, his tone guarded but polite. While he seemed to be trying to hide his scrutiny, Naruto could feel his eyes lingering on the tanto strapped to his back. Naruto slid a coin across the counter. A tonic, please, for the two of us. The bartender's gaze sharpened at the sight of the coinage, quickly palming it, he got to work, and soon, they were both nursing pints with suspiciously strong aromas. While the locals had grown quiet amongst themselves, the man closest to them cleared his throat. We don't see travelers around here often. Where are you coming from? Just a bit further north. My sister and I are looking for job opportunities. Well, you won't find that around here. All you'll get around here is a bit of fishing. Most of the young people already left a long time ago. I've heard there's growing business further south, piped in the lone woman. With that new bridge they built along the southern coast, and all that increased traffic, business has been booming. Nodding, Naruto replied, yes, so I've heard. But the climate there is a little too warm for my sister, so we've been looking around this area. Immediately, Karen began to fan herself. And, when they were alive, our parents used to say our ancestral roots were here. There. Naruto turned his attention to the door. Ancestral roots, you say. There was a disruption in the flow of the air. One, two. By Naruto's estimate, there were three individuals waiting outside for them. A full squad, then. Given the expertise with which they had disguised their approach, they had to be ninja. It would have escaped his notice if there hadn't been a badly patched break in the window letting in the outside heat. Well, where are our manners? What are your names? Boom. With a deafening cracking sound, the ceiling split open in a ragged reveal of the blue sky. Amidst a sudden rain of splinters, Karen hurled herself on top of the red-headed local in the corner, and after a moment's consideration, Naruto kicked aside a large wooden beam that would have otherwise impaled the bartender. Their faces hidden in the ensuing dust cloud, their attackers swiftly assaulted Naruto in a flurry of deadly swipes. As he dodged, he thought one of his attackers' tai jutsu felt oddly familiar. The rhythm and the flow of each movement reminded him of someone he had once sparred very frequently with. Ducking below a kunai blade, Naruto crouched low to the ground and sent out an electrical current through the floor of the building, updating him in a flash. Karen and the civilians were largely unharmed, though one nursed a small injury to their shoulder. It was time to move this elsewhere. With a swift draw of a kunai from his holster, Naruto threw. It sliced through the air, aimed straight for the face of the most mobile attacker. They evaded, nimbly ducking and shooting forward. Only for Naruto to grab them by their collar and throw them bodily at the door. With another splintering sound, the far wall shattered into pieces. Lee! shouted one of the attackers. A female voice, and a familiar one at that. As the dust cloud settled, Naruto stepped out into the open and took in the faces of his opponents, who had regrouped around the one he had thrown, a kanoichi with hair rolled up into buns. Two men, one with a bowl cut and the other with pale eyes. The three all sported hitai ate with the familiar swirling leaf etched on the metal. 
so his pursuers from the Hidden Leaf had finally caught up with them. Naruto was far from surprised. On the contrary, he thought it had taken them long enough to find them. With the loss of two Jinchuriki, he would have expected Danzo to exhaust all of his resources in a manhunt. While Naruto knew little of the newly instated Hakage, given the limited information he had gleaned before leaving the village, it seemed the most likely direction of his authority. But. The identities of his pursuers was a surprise. Naruto had expected masked Hanbu, not a squad that he had history with, however limited. Please, Naruto, said Tenten, as she helped a bloodied Lee to his feet. It's not too late. Turn yourself in. You can still come back to the village. That's funny, Naruto replied, drawing his tanto. Because you three were definitely trying to kill me just now. Our missive was to catch you, dead or alive, said Neji. As for my preference. His eyes bulged as he activated his Byakugan, and he held his hands up in a seal. But raising a hand, Tenten blocked him. Rock Lee spat out a glob of blood and wiped his lip. Naruto, how could you kill those people? How could you betray the leaf? I don't understand. Why did you turn on our village? Tenten pleaded. Stand aside, Tenten. I always found it suspicious how his teammates died. He's merely showing his true colors now. At that, Tenten flinched. Her eyes darted searchingly towards Naruto, but he didn't say anything. After a long moment, she lowered her arm in defeat. Then, Naruto called out Karen. Clang! Brightly glowing chains burst out from the building behind them, circling around the three leaf nin. While Neji and Tenten leaped out of the way, Rock Lee was a beat too slow with his injuries, and the chains tightened around him. Quick drawing kunai into her hands, Tenten kicked off as she landed and burst towards Naruto. But he had already predicted Tenten's trajectory, because her way of fighting was familiar to him. This is Tenten, guys. These are my teammates, Mayu and Naruto. He recalled now. Tenten had trained alongside his old teammate, growing up. Like Rai had been, she was a weapons specialist, and even now, years later, he could see Rai's taijutsu echoed in some of her movements. But while the similarities would have once given Naruto some pause, he continued to swing his tanto through the air, because he couldn't let it stop him. Not here. Not now. Not when, for the first time in years, he could see so clearly the path laid out before him. That was why he wouldn't apologize for what he was about to do. Who is your enemy? Plunging his tanto into Tenten's shoulder, Naruto slammed her down to the ground. The sound of cracking bone rang out sharply, and Tenten let out an agonized splutter. Behind them, still struggling against Karen's chains, Lee screamed. Neji, to his credit, didn't blink. Hands outstretched, his famed eyes focused, he swung around his teammate and aimed a deadly blow at Naruto. Lightning crackled. One instant, Naruto was sitting atop Tenten, his hands still on the blade, the next, he was behind Neji. He raised a hand, crackling with lightning chakra, to Neji's neck. But just as he chopped down, Neji rolled forward in a quick dodge. Rising to his feet, his chest heaving, Neji directed a hostile glare at Naruto. Things won't go quite as they did the last time we faced each other. Perhaps. Lightning chakra began to surge through Naruto's body. Perhaps not. Yogito POV Yagido was trailing the border between fire country and river country when she spotted something oddly shaped in the murky distance. If it weren't for the dense fog, she would have seen it earlier, as it stood out starkly amidst the endless plains. As she drew closer, she realized it was an arrangement of different sized rocks. A flat sheet of rock rested on four smaller boulders, with several rocks scattered across its top. It must have been a shrine or a memorial of some sort. At the thought, an image flashed through her mind, bright, flickering flames, crumbling rocks, a charred body, lying on the ground. Yugito let out a sharp exhale, clearing her head, but despite herself, she could feel her eyes growing hot. She'd stopped through two villages now, but she had yet to find any of the cloud's undercover agents. It was improbable. Nay, impossible. That she was the sole survivor of the hidden cloud. And yet, as she traveled through the endless plains of fire country, she had never felt so alone. Looking down at the rock shrine, as she remembered everything she had lost, she had a sudden thought. Back in the hidden cloud, their customary rite of passage for their debt included keeping vigil for three days and nights in order for their spirits to arrive safely in the afterlife. She hadn't had a moment to herself since the bombing of their village, let alone three days to spare to mourn her lost comrades. Standing alone in front of that foreign shrine, however, she finally allowed herself a moment to bow her head and utter a prayer. Watch over me, Yogito said silently. Guide me to my comrades. And I will make our enemies pay. In her mind, she saw Darui's white-haired figure walking away from her. 
his body was whole and strong, the way she remembered it, and not the charred log that she had last seen. If he had lived, and if the hidden cloud had not fallen, she thought he could have become Rikage. Very sentimental and all. But are you sure you have the time for this? The two tails said suddenly. Quiet, she hissed back. I'm sensing a large chakra signature nearby. Young Ito's eyes snapped open. She immediately dropped down to her haunches, her fingers sharpening into claws. Reveal yourself. A shadow appeared in the fog. It grew darker and larger as it approached. And then, a young man staggered into view. The first thing Yogito noticed was the Hitai 8 slung around the band by his waist that told her he was a sand nin. The second thing she took in was the emaciated appearance of his frame, he looked as though he hadn't eaten or drank water in several days. Finally, she looked at his face. Dark, unfocused eyes, and a prominent red tattoo that stood out starkly on his forehead. Love, who are you? asked Yogito. Karen POV. While Karen was getting more and more used to handling her chakra chains, its use still required the entirety of her concentration. Which meant that as long as they were out, she couldn't sense anything, and for someone like Karen, she might as well have been blind. Nonetheless, at Naruto's command, as they had previously discussed, she had summoned her chains. Unfortunately, only one out of the three leaf nin she had detected had been caught in them. Karen could feel him currently struggling to free himself, but it was futile, of course. Her chains had been strong enough to contain a rampaging jinchuriki, so there was no chance an ordinary ninja could escape. This did mean, however, that Karen was essentially useless in the remaining fight against the other two. An admission made only slightly easier by the knowledge that Naruto had already accounted for this. Your chains will keep at least one of them down. But that should be enough for me to take care of the rest. It still gave Karen a thrill to know that Naruto now counted her in his plans. Counted on her to be there, by his side. She was already squirming at being unable to see him in her mind's eye, and once she had confirmed that the civilians, especially the red-haired fishermen, were safe, she finally ran back outside. Just before she stepped across what remained of the divider, an intense bright light suddenly flashed in the air, almost searing her eyes, followed shortly by an explosion. Karen managed to look away just in time, but even then, all she could see was throbbing circles of yellow and orange. Shaking her head, her eyes narrowed, Karen staggered outside. The circles faded, and as her vision cleared, the sight she saw there took her breath away. Naruto stood alone in the midst of three fallen leaf nin, his entire body surging with lightning, and a ball of wind chakra churning in his hand. Behind him, a bloody tanto pinned the kanoichi by her shoulder, and the remaining male lay prone on the broken ground. The one with the byakugan. Had Naruto discharged that bright light to momentarily blind the male? But above all, what caught her attention the most was his expression. Nearly every time she had ever encountered Naruto, his face had always been blank. Whether he'd been facing her in the Chunin exam, or offering her fish in the forest, or even fighting against Gara, his face had always resembled an emotionless mask. In Karen's opinion, that was even a part of his charm. But his expression now. It was as though a tight lid on a box had finally knocked loose, and while Karen didn't have the exact word to describe what she saw peeking through, she felt the hairs on the back of her neck rise. She thought of the times back when she had lain on the ground looking up at the dark sky through the cracks in her ceiling, and she realized someone had been listening to her prayers this whole time. How blessed she was to be by his side, to have been led to him. Are they dead? It was a soft, unfamiliar voice. The red-headed fisherman had stepped outside. He seemed taken aback, but not entirely unsettled, by the sight of the scattered leaf nin on the ground. No, said Naruto. Karen swallowed hard. While their wounds looked severe, if they were treated, they would not be fatal. Is that going to be okay? Naruto knelt on the ground by the fallen leaf nin, his fingers raised in a tiger seal. By the time they wake up, we'll be long gone. And they won't remember a thing. Suddenly, the leaf nin caught in Karen's chains blurted out, we will never give up. He had been quiet until now, and while he seemed to have given up on trying to free himself, his face was contorted with angry tears. I did not want to believe what the others say about you. That you are a monster. But I understand now. You are a traitor, and a danger to the village, and we will chase you no matter how far you go. No. You won't. Stretching his hand out over the leaf nin's neck, Naruto made a twisting motion. The black character blazed over the leaf nin. And then it disappeared. Memories. What kind of seal is that? Jiraiya almost jumped at the sound and whirled around to see Naruto regarding him from the opposing chair. For someone whose voice had only just started to crack from puberty, he was entirely too stealthy. 
This, my young apprentice, is a precious tool of the trade, said Jiraiya grandly, with a sweeping gesture to the body strewn across the floor. Thanks to this luckless fellow and his propensity for talking under the influence of a drink and a willing ear, I've made more than enough headway in my research. The moment he wakes up, he'll be out howling for your blood. After all this time they had spent traveling together, it was remarkable how unconcerned the boy seemed to be for Jureya's well-being. Minato had never been so callous. Perhaps Naruto took after his mother in this regard? And that's where this seal comes in handy. It's a little something I picked up back in the day. By the time I'm done, this fellow will think all of this was just a very, very bad dream. So it isn't the taboo seal? Jureya stopped, the jovial smile on his face fading a degree. Where did you learn about that? I heard the fourth Hakage invented it. As usual, Naruto's face was a blank. But in Jiraiya's long-spanning career, he had yet to meet anyone who could truly hide the depth of their thoughts, and he saw a glimmer of it now in his eyes. Yes, so he did. But you know. After the fact, Minato always regretted it. The taboo seal is forbidden for a reason. It is a terrible seal, leaving the victim at the mercy of their own mind. No, there is absolutely no reason why it should ever be used. The sky was black, the moon was bright, and the air was cold. It was midsummer, but up here in snow country, it wasn't unusual to see snow throughout the year, and given how he'd just been thrown out of the last three taverns he'd visited, Jiraiya considered it a blessing that he wasn't knee-deep. He could have always used a henja, of course, but perhaps as a consequence of the sake currently swirling around in his belly, he couldn't seem to muster one. Stumbling, Jiraiya clumsily sat down on the hard ground. Tipping his head back, he tried to pour another pint of sake into his mouth, craving the sear and burn of it in his throat, but nothing came out. Grunting, he peered into the opening of the pint. It was empty. There was nothing left. Jiraiya looked around to see a large lake nearby, its dark surface frozen over. He reared back his arm, about to fling the bottle into the lake. When, after a moment's consideration, he lowered it and placed it gently on the ground in front of him. Forgive me, little one, he said genially to the bottle. You have fulfilled your duty. There was no response, but he hadn't expected one. After that, Jureya looked out at the lake for a long time. End of chapter 45 Chapter 46, Clear Black Sea Before an enraptured audience, figures dressed in rich robes and garish masks moved slowly across the raised platform. A hollow flute melody accompanied the sound of twanging strings, and two voices rang out in reverberating tones. The wind is cold beyond these slopes. Are you really leaving? Though this life is all I have known, I must find my destiny. In that evening's performance, as the story of a young man leaving his poor island village to become a great warrior unfolded on the stage, the audience was a particularly receptive one, laughing at every joke, clapping at every success, and weeping over every death. One notably expressive individual sat in a gilded chair in his own private box, surrounded by a cohort of attendants and armed guards, as he dabbed at his eyes with his handkerchief. An elderly man with graying hair and dark circles under his eyes, his features would not have stood out if not for the large headpiece denoting his rank. He was a daimyo, and not just any daimyo. He was the fire daimyo, ruler of one of the five great shinobi countries. Holt, stranger. I have not seen one of your likeness around here before. Name your purpose. I have but one purpose. To learn the way of the warrior. That, you shall find here. Going to the theater was one of the daimyo's favorite ways of winding down after a hard day's work. But it had been a particularly trying week, and even as the daimyo found himself engaged in the story on the stage, a part of his mind continued to ponder over the current state of affairs. The leaf village had been attacked, resulting in a number of casualties including none other than the Hakage. In the following emergency, the replacement the daimyo had chosen, by recommendation from his advisors, had proven to be a surly brute of a man. Responding to the daimyo's goodwill with curt statements that could at best be described as graceless and at worst insubordinate, the daimyo was beginning to wonder whether his decision to nominate the next Hakage had been brash. Have you no master, boy? You shall die within the fortnight to your enemy. I have no master anymore, this is true. But neither have I an enemy. You fool. Your enemies circle you as we speak. Not to mention that, the last the daimyo had heard, the wind daimyo, had gone into hiding out of fear of being assassinated by his own subjects. The only remotely good news was that the hidden cloud had been raised to the ground, leaving Lightning Country virtually defenseless. The leader of Lightning Country had been getting far too cocky lately, personally speaking, the fire daimyo was glad to see his rival getting taken down a peg. All in all, it was a real mess, the likes of which the daimyo hadn't seen since the last Shinobi World War. 
is it true? You can take me across this endless sea? There is a price, of course. There is always a price. Name it, sir, and I shall pay it. Amidst a tumultuous passage of time, it had been some years since the daimyo had reflected on the last war. Following on the heels of the First World War, the Second War had erupted in the beginning of the daimyo's reign, when he was still fresh-faced and eager to prove himself as his predecessor's equal. Many had died in that war, and other daimyo had been toppled quicker than they could be officially coronated. Even the Whirlpool village had been overrun and their daimyo overthrown, which, given their reputation for fuinjutsu, had been greatly shocking at the time. Though, with all things considered, that had probably been for the best. An opinion, of course, the fire daimyo had always taken care to conceal beneath a sympathetic, stoic demeanor. Still, no matter the current conflict, the daimyo wasn't too concerned. He was no longer the overeager greenhorn of his early reign. He had survived countless crises over the years, and he would survive this, too. Once the dust had settled, everything would be returned to its rightful place, and the world would continue onwards. As it always had. Take this weapon, for it is all I can give you. Farewell, have you no other last words for me? Everything you require, you already possess. You need only realize it. Now hurry, the sun is setting, and the night is nigh. Shifting comfortably in his seat, the daimyo returned his full attention to the play. The coming scenes were his favorite, and he didn't want to miss a single moment. Naruto, POV Walking over to Tenten's prone body, Naruto tugged out his tanto. The lightning chakra had cauterized her wound, and it came out smoothly, wiping off the darkened blood, he sheathed it. Before he could turn away, Rai's words flashed in his head again. This is Tenten, guys, and Naruto looked hard at the Kanoichi's pale, drawn face. When she woke up, she would have no recollection of his whereabouts or of how close his blade had been to her heart. The effects were courtesy of the taboo seal, the same seal that had once entrapped Naruto as a child, and the irony of the reversed situation was not lost upon him. If the truth ever came out, they would doubtless call him a monster for this as well. Though, given the situation, Naruto hadn't had any other choice, aside from outright killing them. A distant, clarifying thought surfaced. Was that why the Hakage had used the taboo seal on him all those years ago? I thought for sure you were Leaf Nin, said the red-haired man, his eyes roving from body to body. But it seems I was wrong. Both his tone and expression seemed neutral in the true sense of the word, rather than the carefully schooled facade that Naruto was used to seeing, and out in the daylight, the man's features were more apparent than they had been in the shadows of the pub. With freckles scattered across his face, he was younger than Naruto had first thought, and his frame was stockier than it had appeared before. We're looking for the way to the hidden whirlpool, said Naruto. You know how to get there, don't you? The man's gaze drifted to Naruto's face, and after a moment's search, he nodded. I do. Well, that wasn't so hard, said Karen, her eyebrows shooting up. Sitting down hard by the splintered remains of the stairwell, the man reached into his pocket and produced a carton of cigarettes. You're not the first travelers to have searched for the hidden whirlpool, far from it. Nor will you be the last. While the way has been blocked off to all those who wish any harm to the village, it has been my duty for the past several years to guide those with a legitimate claim. The monotonous and rapid delivery of his lines reminded Naruto of one of the seasoned tour guides who'd used to take envoys from other villages around the Hidden Leaf scenic route. It was clear the man had spoken those very same words many times before. Your duty? Naruto echoed. Is the village active? I suppose it must be. How has the whirlpool existed all these years without catching the eye of the leaf? Their scouts wouldn't have missed any patterns of traffic over time near fire country borders. The man let out an exhale of smoke that could have also been a sigh. Very few enter the hidden whirlpool. And even fewer leave. What's that supposed to mean? Demanded Karen. Are you saying that they don't let people leave? Everyone is free to leave the village. But there is no need to leave the village. Naruto couldn't detect a lie in his cryptic words, however, as was often the case, it was not what was actually spoken that he paid attention to, but rather the intent behind it. This man, long-suffering attitude aside, wanted them to go to the hidden whirlpool. Perhaps, somehow, he had even been waiting for them. The real question was, was the risk of walking into what was most likely a trap worth the unclear benefits? Unfortunately, their time was limited. In the not-so-far distance, Naruto could sense something stirring. The sleepy village had finally caught on to the destruction of the pub. The man must have sensed it as well, because he rose to his feet. The rest of your questions will have to wait. Come meet me by the shore on the night of the full moon. Though, now that my cover here has been blown, I imagine I'll have to move on from this post soon. The man exhaled another thin plume of smoke. Not that I mind. 
This place was kind of a dump, anyways. Seizing Tenten and Neji's bodies from the ground, Naruto took one last look back at the red-haired man. Who is your enemy? As the sounds of shouts drew closer, he said. My name is Naruto. What's your name? At that, the man's lips reared back to reveal a row of surprisingly sharp incisors. Yushima. Yuzumaki Yushima. Yugito POV. They'd said the village was full of traitors. They were traitors because they had evaded their dues owed to the Lightning Daimyo and refused to send the year's quota of children for mandatory induction at the Hidden Cloud. They'd said that in order to maintain their village's reputation, the traitors needed to be taught a lesson. That it would be a good exercise in trying out Yugito's tailed beast transformation. It was a foggy day, and that helped. It didn't quite hide the smell of fire or mute the clamor, but by the time the heavy fog rolled back over the village, all was still, as though nothing had ever been there to begin with. When Yagido finally felt her claws retract into her skin, she fell back on the ground. She was panting hard, even though, truthfully speaking, it hadn't been a difficult task at all. Blood pulsed in her ears, and she wondered at the exhaustion numbing her limbs. She'd never felt so tired before. Not even when her training was so grueling that every inch of her skin was black and blue, and she couldn't tell where bruised flesh ended and tailed beast fire began. Suddenly, she sensed something. Movement, concealed in the roiling fog. In a flash, Yugito leaped to her feet, her fingers sharpening into claws. Reveal yourself. A dark shadow appeared in the fog. It grew darker and larger as it approached, and then, a boy staggered into view. The first thing Yugito noticed was that he was a civilian. The second thing she took in was the emaciated appearance of his frame, an orphan out on the streets, perhaps. Finally, she looked at his face. Heavy set eyes, and a crop of white hair that stood out starkly against his dark skin. Who are you? Yugito demanded. What are you doing here? Why hadn't he tried to run away, like all the others? They called me Darui, said the boy, with a gulp. You're real strong, lady. Can you teach me to be like that, too? It was a memory she had been desperately trying to suppress, but it surged with a vengeance now at the sight of the young man lying at Yugito's feet. Physically, he was as different as one could get from the Darui of her memories, but she still couldn't help but draw parallels as she cautiously drew closer. Just as quickly, however, the details that were cropping up with every sweep of his appearance sent Yagito's thoughts racing in all new directions. A large chakra signature. The sand hit I-8. The blood-red tattoo on his forehead. This man was the infamous Jinchuriki of the hidden sand. There were no ifs, ands or buts about it, a genin from her village could have pieced it together. It all but confirmed her suspicions that Akatsuki's attack on the hidden cloud had not been isolated. Given the circumstances surrounding their attack and the flurry of covert movement Yugito had noticed in every country she'd traveled to so far, she had grimly prepared herself for the worst. But if the Hidden Sands Jinchuriki was wandering alone, half-dead, in the wilderness, the sheer scale of the possible implications was chilling. The Rikage had always told their village that the Fourth World War was coming. It was the reason why even through the armistice, the Hidden Cloud had continually worked to extend their military reach. Yet, here they were at the cusp of war, and their village had been burned to the ground without even being graced with a chance at retaliation. Yugito reached out with a hand, before immediately pulling it back as a whip of sand lashed out at her. Instead of chasing her, the sand retreated into the gourd slung across the Jinchuriki's back. The Jinchuriki was in no condition to be defending himself, so it had to be an automatic defense mechanism. Perhaps it was the One Tail's influence? Suddenly, the Jinchuriki spasmed, his arms growing stiff by his sight as his back arched. His eyes rolled back, and he let out a monstrous scream that didn't quite match up to the ragged movement of his mouth. The haze around him was starting to turn red, almost like volcanic steam, and Yugito felt her stomach nodding at the sight. At first glance, it was just an untrained Jinchuriki form. But something was different. The chakra shroud didn't so much look like it was corroding the Jinchuriki as it was assimilating him. As for the source of this distortion, blue flames exploding in her hands, Yugito lunged forward for the site where the haze was densest. Above the costal margin, just left of the midline of his sternum. His heart. Clinic somewhere in fire country. For the past several years, the medic had worked hard to grow her residence into a proper clinic. What had started out as a cot in a shed had expanded into proper hospital beds, each set up with their own four unit, alongside a well-stocked cabinet of a wide spectrum of antibiotics and pain medications. Not a single day passed without incident. Whether it was a patient initially coming in for stitches and a round of antibiotics before spasming from acute sepsis due to a poison kunai blade, 
or a patient coming in to restock on meds before abruptly going into sudden cardiac arrest due to chronic chakra pill abuse. The medic had seen just about everything there was to see. So when an unidentifiable shinobi turned up at the medic's door with a squad of half-dead leaf nin in tow, she didn't bat an eye. You're the medic? The young ninja who spoke was of nondescript appearance, which tended to be the norm for her usual clientele. Her no-questions-asked policy had made her clinic a popular destination amongst those with no allegiance to any of the major hidden villages. The medic gave a curt nod. Yes, I am. Assuming they're all still alive, I'm afraid I don't have enough beds for three. Money is of no concern. The ninja threw over a pouch, which the medic snatched out of the air. Drawing it open, she counted the coins and then nodded to her assistant, who hurried forward to check the bodies. Two males, one female, all looking thoroughly beaten up. The female especially looked in need of immediate attention. The three-man cell. Even if they hadn't been bearing the hit I ate, their uniforms were a dead giveaway as to their identities. Leaf Nin, of middling rank, at least. What were they doing here? And who was the man bringing them in? The medic couldn't spot a hit I ate on his person. Well. It wasn't her problem. Not anymore, at least. Very well, she said. I trust I can count on your discretion, said the ninja, a hint of steel in his tone. You wouldn't be here if you knew you couldn't, the medic replied just as pleasantly, fingering the poison senbin hidden up her sleeve. Will you be back for them? What do you mean? Said the ninja. I was never here. Then, in a whirlwind of dust, he disappeared. Karen POV You there, my dear. Amidst a hubbub of the lively market, Karen had to look around and then point at herself, before the elderly woman gesturing from her stall, nodded her head. Yes, you. Come here, I have something for you. The little chakra that the woman had harbored no malice, and when Karen drew near, she realized that the old woman was draped in sparkling jewelry. I'm not interested. Karen began, but before she could finish her sentence, the woman swooped in with a speed that could have put again into shame. Now, now. I can tell with just a single glance. You're suffering from love problems, aren't you? Love problems? Karen stammered, her face flushing. It's written all over your little face. Let me guess. Your feelings are one-sided, and you haven't been able to pluck up the courage to tell him? Karen flushed harder, and the woman's eyes gleamed with opportunity. Well, I have just a thing here. Something shone in the daylight. And a moment later, Karen felt hands on her shoulders, turning her around, and her hair being drawn back. The woman rustled up a mirror for Karen to check her appearance. Pulling her hair back was a blue cord made up of oddly shaped stones. Karen blinked, and her reflection in the mirror did the same. She reached up to touch the stones, and the cool, serrated texture gave her a moment's pause. What kind of stone is this? Why, is this your first time to the coast? It's no stone at all. It's called a seashell, Karen faintly filled in, surprising herself. She hadn't realized that she still remembered the word. How much is it? Fifteen Ryo, and that's a bargain, came the eager reply. I've got the cheapest prices you'll find on this side of the coast. It was rather cheap, in fact, but being who she was, Karen would have bartered the price down to at least half the initial offer. This time, however, she simply handed the bills over. He won't be able to take his eyes off you, now, chirped the woman. One of the reasons Karen had come out to the town at all had been to check on the traps she'd set along the shore. A quick check revealed three fish swimming restlessly in endless circles, which she filleted on the spot before stacking them in her basket, and then, with another long look at her reflection, she began to trek back to their hideout. Currently, they were camped out at an abandoned hut along the fringes of a neighboring forest. As always, Karen checked the vicinity using her mind's eye, a habit in vigilance that she was quickly improving with every passing day. I'm back. She called out. A moment passed, and then, did you see anything today? A red-headed young man stepped out from the shadow of the forest. He appeared to be Naruto upon first glance, but Karen knew that it was his clone. The real Naruto had been gone for extensive swaths of time over the past week. Presumably, he was gathering intel on the movements of the Akatsuki, the Leaf Village, and whoever else was trying to track them down and kill them. Which could, at this point, be pretty much anyone. No, I couldn't detect anyone suspicious. The same people who were there yesterday were there today. The clone looked up at the darkening sky. And tonight is the full moon. Maybe that man was lying to us about being in Uzumaki. He didn't look much like you. This was met with an oddly contemplative look. I've been told I look more like my father than my mother. Leaving it at that, he stepped back into the forest. I should be coming back soon. Sure enough, Karen was almost done roasting her catches over the fire pit when she noticed in her mind's eye that the clone had disappeared. 
Shortly afterwards, an identical chakra signature rapidly approached their hideout. Brightening, just as she rose to her feet, Naruto's figure swooped in from the open window. Dinner's ready, Karen said, suddenly feeling shy. For some reason, even though she felt comfortable enough around Naruto's clones, whenever Naruto himself was there, something about him felt just a little more distant. Did you learn anything today? When Naruto didn't respond straight away, Karen recognized the unfocused look in his eyes. He was processing the memories of all the clones he'd just called back. While anyone else in Naruto's position would likely have long since passed out from both chakra and mental exhaustion, due to the sheer number of clones he was controlling, the only physical hint of it that Karen could see was the darkened shadows under his eyes. Once his gaze refocused, Karen knew he was all caught up for the day. Danzo has sent out quite a few hunter nins in pursuit of us, but not as many as I'd expected. He seems to be prioritizing the continued safety of the village instead. Naruto sounded perplexed at his own words. Even, Karen dared to think, disappointed. Anyways, I doubt Yoshima would have gone too far from the coast, which can only mean that, as we thought, he has a way of hiding from your mind's eye. Karen frowned. Somehow, the thought that her ability may not be totally unique to her stung a little. I guess there's even more to the hidden whirlpool than we thought. The roasted fish was scorching hot to the touch, and as Karen blew on her portion to cool it down, it reminded her, somewhat, of her home back in grass country. She glanced over at Naruto, who remained seated on the floor, staring into the flickering flames of the fire pit. We'll get there, said Karen. No matter what. Even if, privately, she was starting to have second thoughts about going there. Naruto looked up at her. Yes, I have no doubt. He paused, his brow furrowing as he seemed to finally take in her appearance. You look different. Both Karen's heart and her hand jumped up. I tied up my hair. So it doesn't get in the way. Something about the look on his face made her stomach flip-flop. You don't like it? The blue doesn't look good in my hair, huh? It looks nice, said Naruto. It just reminded me of someone. Something about the expression on his face caused a pang in Karen's chest. It reminded me of someone, too. My mom. She used to have a necklace with a similar looking stone. A seashell. What happened to it? Someone stole it, she said ruefully. I hadn't thought about it in a long time, but there was someone selling this in the market for 15 ryo. Good price, huh? She paused. Or maybe it was wasteful. I don't really know. Not bad, Naruto said simply, before returning to his meal. He didn't press further, and Karen could tell it was not out of courtesy, but rather out of a lack of interest. It was strange, she thought, because he seemed to thirst for knowledge about many things. And yet when it came to certain topics, his indifference was like a blank wall. What about you? Karen asked. You. Or your clone, said you look more like your dad than your mom. Where are they? They died when I was born. Karen winced. Oh. It shouldn't have surprised her, orphans were hardly a rare statistic in their part of the world. I'm sorry. What for? I never knew them. Well, yes, she said, blinking. But isn't it normal to miss your family? I wouldn't know, said Naruto. I've never had one. He sounded bemused, more than anything, and somehow, that gave Karen more pause than his actual response. She opened her mouth, searching for the words to say. When something dark in the periphery of her mind flashed, and she froze. All other thoughts leaving her head, Karen squeezed her eyes shut, and confirmed it in her mind's eye, before saying out loud, Naruto, it's him. Yushima. He's nearby. Gara POV. Everything was hazy and red. He couldn't differentiate what was what, and it had been that way for as long as he could remember. It was all jumbled up. The skies, his hands. A voice, screaming in his splitting head, Gara, stop. He was no stranger to screaming voices, but this voice. It was not the one he was used to hearing. And while once upon a time, he would have killed anyone who dared try and stop him, now, now that he was well and truly alone. He just wanted it all to end. As you wish, said a voice. His eyes opened, and for a long moment, he lay prone, wondering what had changed. It was dark, though he could hear the crackling and feel the warmth of a nearby fire. He must have been in a cave of some sort, he could sense the whistling of wine through cracks in the rock, and the drip of water seeping into the hard ground. As for himself, his lips were parched and his entire body hurt, but he could feel his heart thumping in his chest, and he suddenly realized how quiet it all was. That was what had changed. You're awake, said a woman's voice. Gara turned his head. Even the slight motion of it sent a sharp spasm through his back. And saw an unfamiliar woman with long blonde hair tied back. From where she sat behind the fire, he couldn't spot any obvious identifiers such as a hit I ate, 
but her presence and physique made it clear she was a ninja, and a powerful one at that. Somehow, Gara had the feeling that even his sand armor wouldn't mount much of a defense against this foreign woman. He felt completely exposed, as though he'd lain back in the mouth of his enemy and bared his neck. And yet, as vulnerable as he was, he felt calm. What? Did you do to me? He croaked. Naruto, POV. The dark sea basked in the glow of the full moon. Its surface was so startlingly still, if it wasn't for the sound of the waves in his ears and the feel of the high tide brushing the undersides of their sandals, Naruto would have thought they were looking out at a lake. The man who'd called himself Yoshima had discarded his fisherman garb for a black robe that blended into their surroundings, making it appear as though his face was floating in midair. He was waiting for them in a wooden boat with a large sculling oar in one hand and a smoldering cigarette in the other. The boat bobbed haphazardly in the water as Naruto and Karen stepped aboard. We're going out there in this? Karen voiced skeptically. Yoshima shrugged. It's the only boat I've still got left in one piece. Leaving it to them to infer his meaning, he pushed off, and the boat began to glide through the water. As the creaking of the boat filled Naruto's ears and the shore at their backs grew smaller, for a moment, he looked up at the night sky. The full moon was so large and so bright, it almost looked like the sun. In my village, the moon has always been considered an object of worship, said Yushima, with another exhale of smoke. She controls the tides, which in turn create the whirlpools that have always protected our nation. As though in response, the lapping of waves against the side of the boat grew stronger, and the boat began to lurch. Is this going to get much worse? Karen asked, nervously. I'm afraid this is just a beginning, said Yushima, looking amused. You said that your name is Yuzumaki, said Naruto. Are there others with that name in your village? Oh, yes. The Yuzumaki clan was one of the founding clans at the time of the village's establishment. How has your village kept its continued survival a secret for this long? Hmm. We tried very hard, Yoshima replied. He's lying, Naruto, said Karen, leveling a dirty look at the man. Yoshima let out a laugh, a startling sound that broke in the air like waves on a rocky shore. I am many things, but I am no liar. I assure you that. Now, we are approaching Whirlpool territory. From now on, whatever you do, try not to leave the boat. The roar of the water was growing increasingly louder, Naruto looked back out at the sea to see that it was churning. The boat rocked wildly, to the point that Naruto had to channel Chakra to his feet to stop himself from losing his balance, and cold seawater sprayed his face. A drifting cluster of clouds must have passed by, because suddenly, the moon disappeared. The sky darkened, and the sea turned black. Whatever was still below his feet began to spin in circles, and seawater sloshed around his legs. Naruto, shouted Karen's voice. Karen, he replied. Use your chains. But there was no reply. Or, if there was, he couldn't hear it over the sound of the roar of the water that circled around them. Had Yushima been lying about guiding them? No. He may not have been entirely forthcoming, but he had been telling the truth about that. Gritting his teeth against the salt of the seawater, Naruto reached out with a hand to position himself. And suddenly, the clouds passed. The full moon hung in the sky once more, stark in its brightness, and everything stopped. The boat no longer rocked. The water that had threatened to submerge them had disappeared, and the sea around them was still. It was quiet, unnaturally so, and when Naruto looked around, he was the only one on the boat. Both Yushima and Karen were gone. But somehow, even though he couldn't see or hear anything, even though he wasn't using his lightning chakra, he could sense it. A presence. Naruto's hand leapt to the tanto on his back, and he straightened up. Who's there? He called out. While there was no response, he knew he wasn't alone. There could only be one explanation for this, it was again jutsu of some sort, which meant somebody had to be behind it. He brought his hands together in a seal to disrupt his chakra and dissipate the illusion. But nothing changed. Something sounded in his ears, like the distant sound of waves and the rustling of leaves. Stepping towards the rim of the boat, Naruto looked down at the water's surface. His reflection glared back up at him, the whisker marks on his face glowing in the moonlight. He reached out with a hand to break the reflection. When, suddenly, another face appeared next to his. A girl's face. Mayu, said Naruto. She didn't respond. But she didn't run away, either, and when he looked up, she was still there, standing next to him. Appearance-wise, Mayu looked the same as she always did when she appeared to him. Pale-faced, with long brown hair pinned back with a blue clip, and in standard leaf tune in attire. She looked the same as she had on the day she'd died, and Naruto suddenly realized that he was older than her now. Wordlessly, Mayu reached out to his face. Her fingers were warm when they had no right to be, and then suddenly, an even warmer pair of lips pressed against his. 
Naruto's eyes widened and his mind went blank. But before he could react, the sensation was already falling away, and then Mayu was stepping over the boat's edge. Walking across the still water, she turned around and held her hand out to Naruto in a clear invitation. Naruto considered the phantom staring at him, his lips burning. If Mayu had survived that day, how would she look now? Would she have been hunting Naruto down at the orders of the new Hakage with the rest of them? Or would she have quit active duty by now and begun working with orphans as she'd once wanted? He would never know. I can't go with you, said Naruto. Frowning, Mayu gestured more insistently, to which he stood his ground. A dark look passed over her face. And then, in an instant, Mayu's features contorting in a way that he'd never seen before, she lunged towards him. Her slender fingers, now impossibly cold, wrapped around Naruto's neck, choking him with an alien strength he knew that she didn't possess, as she tried to drag him off the boat and into the ocean. For a moment, Naruto didn't retaliate. Instead, through the pain of his windpipe being crushed, he thought of the girl who had haunted his memories for the past three years, and he thought about everything he had decided to do. That hole inside of you. Nothing in this world will ever fill it. At the memory of the masked man's words, Naruto's mouth drew back in a rough grin. He croaked out, isn't this enough? There was no response from the phantom, who continued to strangle him with single-minded determination. The black of the ocean was beginning to bleed into his vision, and staggering, Naruto reached out. It was over in an instant. Mei's eyes looked into his, then down at the tanto jutting out of her chest. He'd plunged it in so deep, he could only see the tip of the hilt. Her hands fell lifelessly from his neck, and as Naruto gasped for air, her lips mouthed a single word, before she fell back into the water with a crash. At the sight of her shadow plummeting into the depths of the ocean, somehow, Naruto felt simultaneously lighter and colder. Who is your enemy? The floor of the boat rocked, and Naruto lurched again. When an iron grip steadied him by the arm. He turned to see Yoshima, who regarded him with surprised scrutiny, before pulling away to take another drag of his cigarette. Karen lay next to him, seemingly unconscious. With a sharp exhale, Naruto checked for her pulse, before sitting heavily back down. After a moment, he checked his own neck, but there was no sign that he'd ever been strangled. He reached for his back next. His tanto was gone. Naruto's hand dropped to his side. What was that? Proof of the blood running through your veins. Proof of the conviction needed to enter the hidden whirlpool. Yushima pointed eagerly. Look, we're almost home. What at first appeared to be an extension of the night sky turned into an array of glimmering lights in the distance. And then dark silhouettes appeared on the horizon. Growing bigger and bigger, until finally, they became a harbor. Buildings, lights, other boats, bobbing in the water. And smaller figures that dotted the docks. People. The people of the hidden whirlpool. A distance away, back on the coastline that marked the end of Fire Country territory, a solitary figure in a black cloak with red clouds stood on the sandy shore. He looked out at the clear, black sea, lit up in the glow of the full moon, thinking about the past. Kakashi, you promised me. Protect Rin, whatever it takes. Back then, he had been a different person. He had thought such things and felt such things because he had known absolutely nothing about anything. Because he had still held expectations from this nonsensical world. The Sharingan's full power is unleashed when left and right are brought together. Removing the orange mask that both concealed and defined his identity, he fixed both of his red eyes on the distant horizon. Isn't that right? A hiss and a distorted flickering in his consciousness alerted him. There's been a sighting of the remaining Jinchuriki, a voice spoke in his head. We believe they may be somewhere in river country. At that, he roused himself. With one last look at the sea, he turned to leave. Every piece was playing out their role as he'd predicted. And he would make sure that they continued to do so, until the world was finally as it should be, for that was the role he had been assigned. But for now. He would keep watching. He was always watching. End of chapter 46 Chapter 47 Dead Sea Naruto was no stranger to being at the receiving end of an inordinate number of stairs, but as he lifted up Karen's unconscious body and stepped onto the dock, the experience somehow felt alien. It could probably be attributed to the fact that even though the level of scrutiny was the same, the vast majority of the staring seemed curious, rather than hostile. Even at nighttime, the harbor was well lit with torch lamps that brought the features of the people of the hidden whirlpool into shadowy relief. A quick glance told Naruto that they were not as homogenous as he might have expected, coloring ranged almost as much as one would see in the leaf village, with perhaps a modest predilection towards red hair. 
More surprisingly, the vast majority appeared to be civilians, with the few obvious shinobi concentrated near the front. They surrounded an elderly group, who, given the respectful birth from the rest, held some significance in the village. Is an outsider's arrival such an uncommon event here? Naruto asked. Yushima seemed preoccupied scanning the crowd, his cigarette conspicuously missing from his mouth, and his reply was curt. Quite. An elderly woman approached them, holding out a stone cup with a dark, steaming beverage. She motioned towards Karen, who'd remained resolutely unconscious. Please, have your companion drink this. It will help wake her. Taking the cup, Naruto regarded the woman. Who smiled pleasantly back. Before lifting it to his own lips to swish the liquid around in his mouth. Herbs, ginger, and something faintly sweet. After pouring a few drops from the flask into Karen's mouth, her eyes flew open. What? What happened? She asked, blinking in her disorientation. One moment we were on the boat, and the next, I saw. I saw. She stopped as she took in the crowd surrounding them, her eyes widening. Is this the hidden whirlpool? It is, said the woman kindly. Welcome home. You are safe here, now. Home? That's right, said a low, gravelly voice. You are our brethren, for the island has accepted you. The voice belonged to an older man who stood at the forefront of the elderly group Naruto had spotted earlier on. His long white hair and goatee suggested an age that did not quite match the visible strength in his frame and eyes, and for a moment, Naruto's thoughts flashed towards the memory of the third Hokage. The island? Karen repeated slowly. Then what I saw. That wasn't, real? I'm afraid not, said the older man. That was the effect of a seal placed around the entirety of the island, to prevent the likes of outsiders from crossing our borders. He spat out the word as though it was poison in his mouth. Oh, said Karen, blinking rapidly. I knew it couldn't be. For a moment, Naruto caught a glimpse of wetness in her eyes, but she blinked, and it was gone. Gesturing to Karen, the woman said, come. You will need to rest to fully recover from the aftereffects. Instead of following after the woman, Karen looked back at Naruto. The older man must have noticed, for he added, I give you my word, as the chieftain of the hidden whirlpool, that no harm shall come to either of you here. I'm sure you have many questions and I assure you, I have many answers. Answers? Naruto inclined his head. Then to start. How do you know about us? The older man took a step forward. I've been waiting for you for quite some time now. My name is Yuzumaki Ashina. It's time we had a talk about your family, Naruto. Gara POV. What? Did you do to me? Croaked Gara. The nearby fire crackled, sending sparks flying in the direction of the ninja, regarding him with an unreadable expression. So you've already noticed. Then again, I don't know how you've managed to last this long with such a primitive seal. Seal? Without responding, the ninja rose to her feet and approached Gara. He tensed, but before he could push his aching body to move, she was already kneeling beside him. Reaching into her pocket, she pulled out what looked like a ration bar and pressed it into his hand. Go on. Sit up and eat. You'll need your energy back to heal. From the sharp tonality of her words, Gara could tell she was used to giving out commands. It was the type of voice that would have once infuriated him, but everything was so quiet now, he obediently brought the ration bar to his lips. As someone raised in the hidden sand, he was no stranger to the threat of poison in his sustenance, but without any hesitation, he bit into it. And found it to be surprisingly flavorful and savory, with a hint of an unfamiliar spice. It reminded Gara of the food in some of the northern countries he'd visited during his missions. The ninja offered him a skin of water that he gulped down and waited until he was done, before she said, you are the Jinchuriki of the hidden sand, are you not? Normally, Gara would not have answered, but everything was so quiet, that before he could stop himself, he answered, yes, I am. What did you do to me? To his surprise, she seemed amused. Hmm. Where to begin? Let's just say the hidden sand has never been very good at Fuinjutsu. Too busy playing with their puppets, I suppose. They were always resorting to stealing intel from other villages. And in your case, they used an incomplete version of a seal from my village to make you a Jinchuriki. So all I had to do was actually finish the seal. Jinchuriki? That meant this woman knew who. What? Gara was. And yet, she didn't seem afraid of him. On the contrary, she seemed to hardly even count him as a threat. Suddenly, her last few words registered in Gara's mind, and he felt his eyes widen. Finish. The seal? The ninja spread her hands open. If I were to liken the former state of your seal to a wall, there was a gaping hole in it. While not quite big enough for the tailed beast to escape, there was plenty of room for it to rampage freely. But now, I've replaced the hole with a door, so to speak. A door that the tailed beast doesn't have the liberty to open. 
a door that only one person has the key to. The ninja smiled in a way that didn't reach her cold eyes. Me, of course. Naruto, POV. Despite Ashina's bold proclamation, the man soon disappeared into the crowd, and it was the elderly woman that had given them the drink who took Naruto and Karen to a complex at the center of the village. As they made their way there, past even more gawking faces, Naruto quickly realized that the island nation was smaller than he had expected, spanning roughly a quarter of the size of the leaf village. And yet, even without tapping into his sage abilities, he could sense a vitality in the land that could very well rival that of the hidden leaf. A powerful undercurrent of energy thrummed deeply throughout the island, leaving Naruto with the unsettling realization that the land of whirlpools was far from the weakened nation in hiding he had expected. Which begged another question. Despite the barriers the hidden whirlpool had erected around their nation, the sheer energy radiating from the island was akin to a lighthouse by the sea. It was hard to believe the other great nations could have missed their continued existence for this long. And also, why? Why had they continued the pretense of their demise? The woman came to a stop in front of a plain concrete high-rise apartment that appeared to be otherwise unoccupied. Here we are. This is where you two will be staying for now, until we can get you properly processed. You can, of course, pick separate rooms or share one. She trailed off meaningfully. Someone will come by soon with your meals. You must be famished. Sure enough, a young woman. Also red-haired. Knocked on the door with a tray laden with bowls of meat stew and fruits. Once the woman had left, Karen eyed the meal with a doubtful look. They wouldn't poison us at this point, right? Without a word, Naruto summoned a clone who, shooting him a sour look, tasted the stew before the two tucked into what felt like their first meal in ages. The food was hearty and filling, and Karen soon knocked out afterwards on a futon they'd found inside the room. Naruto, too restless to sleep, slipped out onto the veranda. The rest of the island seemed to still be awake despite the late hour. The lights of the harbor didn't waver, and in the distance, voices buzzed in conversation. Naruto wondered how the situation was in the Leaf Village, and if anything had happened to Kakashi and his team for letting him go. With Danzo as Hakage and the Akatsuki on the hunt, he couldn't imagine a worse scenario. For now, however, he had time. Borrowed, but useful all the same. He had to use the opportunity wisely to fully make sense of the power locked inside of him. Finally, feeling the burden of exhaustion tug at him, Naruto turned to go back into the room, when he paused, a small alarm sounding in the back of his mind. Something wasn't right. The island was alive with the sound of people, but at the same time, it was a little too quiet. Something was missing, and it took a few seconds before Naruto realized what it was. Black waves lapped against the shore in the near horizon, and yet the ocean was silent. As if sensing his thoughts, a presence suddenly appeared on the level above the veranda. Ashina. Where had he come from? Even Kakashi couldn't approach Naruto without his noticing. Come with me, said the man. Yugido POV A door that the tailed beast doesn't have the liberty to open. A door that only one person has the key to. Yugido smiled coldly. Me, of course. I see, said the Jinchuriki. He looked down at his hands and didn't say anything else. Yugido blinked. Somehow, his reaction hadn't been quite as dramatic as she'd expected it to be. She wondered whether the tailed beast's influence hadn't been quite as damaging to his psyche as she'd presumed. Is that all you have to say? It's strange. Is this what it's like for everyone else? What do you mean? Yugido prompted, bemused at the way the Jinchuriki was looking around white-eyed at the cave, by all appearances again and on their first C-rank mission. The silence. It's so. Loud. Ah, yes. I'd imagine so. Though most, she thought sourly, were not very good at preserving it. Are you also a Jinchuriki? She blinked again. You're not quite what I expected, given the rumors I heard about you, Gara of the Sand. He jerked in response to the name, and for a moment, Yugido caught a glimpse of the rumored beast in his eyes. Before he turned away. What do you want from me? I'm glad to see you're fast on the uptake. Yugido drew herself up. First things first, I want you to tell me everything that you know about the current situation involving the Akatsuki and the other hidden villages. The Jinchuriki nodded, seemingly nonplussed at the prospect of betraying his village. And then, and then you're going to help me find someone. Instead of answering, he looked straight at Yugido, as if to size her up. Despite the undeniable fact that she held the upper hand, his dark eyes betrayed no fear. She crooked a finger in anticipation. When suddenly, the Jinchuriki gave her a nod. She returned it with a terse smile and sat down. Good. We're leaving as soon as it's light out. I'd suggest you rest while you can. There's more ration bars where that came from. 
A pause. You're just going to trust me? Young Ito let out an amused laugh. I don't trust anyone, let alone an enemy nation's jinchuriki, no matter how recently sealed. She wasn't going to tell him, of course, but there was no seal that couldn't be broken. Not even the legendary seal masters of Whirlpool Country had ever managed to pull off such a feat. If they had, perhaps they would have still persisted to this day. Naruto, POV Without explanation, Ashina took Naruto to the opposite side of the village, past a gate reinforced with yellow seals. Taking in the seals. Recognizing in a flash some of the techniques from his brief lessons in Fuinjutsu with Jureya. A pair of shinobi standing guard bow deferentially to Ashina and uncrossed their Najinata. Naruto passed into the stone compound uncontested. Unlike the main village area, which had been lit as bright as a festival and full of inquisitive eyes, it was dim and quiet enough that Naruto knew they were alone. It was an otherwise unremarkable location, looking for all intents and purposes like a generic administrative complex, and yet, Naruto's gaze sharpened. Though he couldn't put his finger on it, something about the area was not quite dangerous, but his senses were warning him to remain vigilant. Where are you taking me? He finally asked. His pace slowing, the older man gave him a ruminative and even surprised look. I sense many questions from you, which is of no surprise to me, but they do not seem to be the questions I expected. And what questions were you expecting? Without responding, Ashina picked up his pace once more and led him to a ground-level building with drab slate tiling at the back of the compound. While dwarfed in size by the taller buildings around it, the entrance took up the entire length of the front-facing wall, giving Naruto the impression of staring into a giant cave. A shiver ran down his spine. The energy he'd felt since earlier pulsated in waves from the entrance, and he knew that whatever lay inside this building was the source of the nation's vitality. As if to dangle the prize before him, Ashina came to a sudden halt. Did you know that the Jinchuriki of the Nine Tails has always been in Yuzumaki? Your predecessor was your mother, and the one before her was a prominent clanswoman before she was sent off to Fire Country. Now, why do you imagine this to be the case? A happy coincidence? said Naruto dryly. Ashina chuckled. My son told me you have a measure of wits about you. I'm sure you can do better than that. Son? So their boatman, Yushima, was the son of the chieftain? The Yuzumaki clan members have large reservoirs of chakra, making them suitable Jinchuriki candidates. It wasn't a difficult conclusion to reach, even with what little information there was regarding the elusive clan. Yes, that is quite correct. Ashina took a step back and gestured to the black opening. But that wasn't what I asked. Why has the Jinchuriki of the Nine Tails always been in Yuzumaki? Naruto paused, taking in the chieftain who regarded him back with a challenging gaze. He was a strange old man he'd only just met earlier that day, in a foreign land filled with people of unknown intentions. There was no way of knowing how long their goodwill towards them would last. Still, Naruto knew that they knew too much about him to underestimate his capabilities, and above all, despite the seeming affluence and resilience of the island, he could smell it. Desperation. Underneath his discipline and his rank, it reeked from the chieftain like a fish market on a hot summer day, and Naruto knew that there was something Ashina wanted from him and as long as that was the case, Naruto could trust him. I don't know, he confessed. That's why I'm here. At that, the chieftain nodded. Very well. Karen POV Usually, the summer season meant everything was hot and sticky. Even when it rained, the raindrops were warm, sizzling like boiling water wherever they touched. And the smell was the worst. When there weren't enough hands to bury the dead, the buzzing of pests and the stink of rotting flesh reached even their housing section, seeping into the grass of their roofs. But that morning was different. They hadn't seen battle in some time, and the day was cloudy, blocking the worst of the heat. When Karen opened her eyes, despite the hunger gnawing in her stomach, there was a light almost pleasant breeze on her arms. And the air was golden. That was the only way to describe it. Rays of light, coming through the holes in their walls, enveloping her and her mother in a golden aura. Her mother was seated nearby, humming a song Karen had never heard before. Her hair, once long and flowing freely, had been cut short the other day under Zasui's orders. What's that from? She asked. Her mother stopped, startled. Oh, my, when did you wake up? Her hand crept to the carved stone of her necklace. It's a song my own mother used to sing to me a long time ago. Your mother? Karen blinked. She'd never considered that her mother had once been a child herself. Where is she now? She returned to the sea, said her mother. As we will, too, one day. To Karen's surprise, when she woke up the next morning, she was greeted by an attendant in what appeared to be traditional Whirlpool country robes, who'd brought her a breakfast tray. 
Next to it, a freshly laundered robe had been laid out for her. This was such a departure from the treatment she'd long since come to expect that, for once, Karen found herself speechless as the attendant helped her change into the robes. The cloth was richer than anything she'd ever worn, and yet lightweight and breathable. Breakfast was modest fare, but the broth was rich and savory, and generously loaded with vegetables and fish. That made two good meals in a row. Truly a first for Karen. When Karen stepped out of her room, she felt like a completely different person. One of Naruto's clones was waiting for her outside the door. Judging from the shadow under his eyes, he appeared to have been standing guard throughout the night. The moment she woke up and realized she was alone, she'd attempted to track Naruto a few times with her mind's eye, but the people of Whirlpool Country all had such bright chakra signatures they were distracting. Furthermore, perhaps as a result of some sort of barrier surrounding the island, there was a strange glow enveloping every single person she could sense, further washing out Naruto's chakra. Where's Naruto? Asked Karen. Is he still with that old man? I imagine so, said the clone. Well, is there anything I should be doing? The clone focused his gaze on her. I'm here to keep an eye on you. Just don't go wandering off. The warning from Naruto that Karen was to keep her head down and avoid revealing any more of her abilities. This, of course, meant that she couldn't trust a single soul in the entire country. Which would be easy enough. Before meeting Naruto, Karen hadn't trusted anyone else in a long, long time. But where was Naruto? Naruto, POV. As soon as he had stepped foot inside the dark entryway, Naruto sensed the change. Though subtle, all sounds from the outside had disappeared. It wasn't just a matter of them being muted, but rather as though, in this space, they didn't exist. It must have been the effect of another barrier, and Naruto had to wonder what else was being filtered out from this space. The only thing there was a spiraling stairwell that plummeted into the depths of the earth. As they descended, Ashina leading the way with a torch in hand, a strange noise sounded in the distance. A hissing, restless sound that grew louder and louder until it became a roar-like tempest. The events of the previous night flashed before Naruto's eyes. The churning water, the black sea, the moon in the sky. The phantom in the water dragging him below the depths, and his missing Tanto. The island has accepted you. That was what Ashina had told them when they'd touched down on land. What had that illusory test been trying to determine from him? At last, just as Naruto was beginning to wonder if he'd been tricked and led down an endless stairwell, they reached the bottom. A grand cave opened up before them. Water dripped from stalactites into a glowing pool of spiraling water. A whirlpool. And there, at its center, there was a woman. Red-haired and sturdily built, but now dangling helplessly as a captive within the roaring water. Naruto felt a chill that had nothing to do with the cold of the cave. Even though he had never met her before, he recognized what she was at once, a jinchuriki. Two halves make a whole, said Ashina. The reason why the jinchuriki of the Nine Tails has always been a Uzumaki. The reason why the whirlpool was once destroyed. They are one and the same. The whirlpool has a jinchuriki, breathed Naruto. Taking in the sight of the captive jinchuriki, goosebumps began to rise on his arms. Like the churning water around them, his chakra surged beneath his skin, as if demanding to be freed. Which one is she? Ashina's gaze was solemn. She is an Uzumaki, just like you, Naruto. And she, too, is the jinchuriki of the Nine Tails. End of chapter 47